how much in the way you've set up the company and you have an international life and you have a domestic life it's like Robert Lepage's company the Ex Machina how much does that international tour exposure income work how does that work in the functioning of your uh, of your company well, it's very very important to us from on the most prosaic level the moment you start touring internationally you're going to attract a different type of sponsor you're, you are recognized outside of your own country and consequently uh, you must be legitimate, you must be important because other people think that you're important. So it certainly, it, I think it certainly uh, opened up doors in terms of fundraising for our board. Um, it simply gave a, little, a level of, uh, of cachet that we wouldn't have had touring simply in Canada or even simply in North America. But beyond that, I Just think take a guess, though. Take a guess. If you hadn't done the international exposure, what percentage less fundraising would have been done here? Oh, yeah, we wouldn't have had Paribas. We wouldn't have had. Uh, we just would not, as Marcel used the yeah. word cachet. I think we'd be considered a very little provincial, a small historical, niche market. yes, uh, yeah. rather than uh, internationally viable. It just ma has made all the difference in the world. I don't know quite how to put it in dollars and cents, but. Yeah, I mean, we're at the point now, Robert, that. I'm happy to say the, the company has grown to the p point that we hardly even know how it functions financially. We know what our constraints are when we're putting a production together and we are given numbers that we'll, or we negotiate numbers that we're going to live with in terms of set design, costume, lighting, all of those things. Right. But the company has grown to the point now, I mean it's a small company by many standards, but with a $2.5 million budget that's beyond anything we could ever have dreamed of when we started. I don't know how I'm amazed that it's so small. Hmm? I'm amazed that your budget is 2.5. Yeah. Well, we, we do small. make it, we do stretch it very well. We've got yeah. wonderful designers that design such lavish looking productions. Yes. Yeah. Now, when we go on tour, of course, that budget moves right. up and we move into three, maybe three million, three and a half million dollars. But uh, if it's an enormous tour, like our huge European tour or our big Japanese tour, but no, we still have to. We still have to work miracles with our, our design, and with our rehearsal process. All of those things. And what does it feel like being Canadians uh, touring to Far East Europe with Baroque opera? Because in fact, you're representing the face of Canada in a way. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, the Asians way, have been wonderfully receptive yeah, to it. Uh, literally, uh, we're treated much more like stars there than we are here. Yes. They line up for autographs and uh, and w something really nice that happened in Korea, they started their own Baroque orchestra. The first time we were there we used their symphony. Usually we travel with Tafel music but we couldn't that time. The second time we were able to use their own Baroque orchestra. Yeah. Our conductor worked with them. We and brought our uh, continual players, yes. but their orchestra, their chorus. So that was a lovely thing to see them doing that and b very well. Yeah. Now they have picked up on this beautiful art form as well. Yeah, it was very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, it was, we felt initially that we were going to be going there with something that was very, very foreign and very exotic from their point of view. I think they thought, the presenters thought the same thing. The amazing thing was after opening night of Figaro, and we were playing in major, major houses and major centers in Japan. In Tokyo, we had a number of guests who were directors from the Kabuki Theater who were in the audience, unbeknownst to us. At the reception after, they came up and said, either you are doing Kabuki or we are doing Baroque opera. Uh, they felt the parallels were astonishing and they gave us tickets to uh, a very traditional kabuki performance that was happening at that time. Uh, we were able to go to see about three hours of what was a 12-hour 18th century production and we were absolutely staggered, particularly by the similarities between the kabuki and the French 17th and 18th century opera ballet. And why do you think those two forms are parallel. I couldn't even begin to I imagine. would say an aristocratic audience. And yes. Kabuki is not even the highest form of theatre. There's yes, no theatre no as well. Yes. But I think it's an audience of initiates. Yes. Still is, I think. Yes. It's very subtle, and apparently no theatre is even more. Uh, you really have to watch closely. You have to have some kind of education to be able to follow it. The stories are traditional stories. They're, the speaking is not normal speech. It's like singing. Uh, there's a lot of dancing and very ge uh, stylized gestural movement. You're speaking of kabuki. Yes, yes. In, in the yes. kabuki. So yeah. it's so much like 
um, Baroque theatre, somehow an aristocratic, well-educated audience seems to elicit that kind of performance. You but see, it's also performance through form. Uh, very much more form, yes. than yes. Well, yes. go back to the conversation mm -hmm. about emotion, yes. but it's actually the form of movement, the form of text, the form of speech, Absolutely. rather than the... Uh, yes. Right. Absolutely. We're, 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 we're looking at visible symbols on stage, visible symbols accompanied by dialogue and music that, again, are meant to em elicit very strong emotional responses from, do. Uh, from the audience. Yes, and they do. And some of these, I mean, where some of these, w you don't need to be sort of culturally sensitized to be able to enjoy them. That's why the people in Japan were amazed and said, your work is like kabuki. That's why we were able to go to the Mubuki and be absolutely staggered and deeply moved by what we saw. Certainly there were all sorts of things that we were probably missing, but there were other things that were constant. And I think this is one of the intriguing things. You look at 17th, 18th century Japanese theatre and 17th and 18th century French theatre and you see stupendous parallels, although there was no opportunity for them to actually come in contact with each other or influence each other. I think it's because we're dealing with a type of theatre that whose whole focus is on finding ways to explore the to, to understand the human heart, to understand the human condition, to explore that and to describe that. Describe it not just in terms of text, but to think the body has got to be narrative. The costumes are narrative. The how, do you mean, the, how do you mean the body has to be narrative? Yes, the, the, body, the body, you come across this phrase again and again in the 17th and 18th century, the sort of injunctions for actors, that the body must be articulate. It must be as articulate as the speech. That the use of rhetorical gesture, exactly what I just used when you we were speaking, the use of rhetorical gesture is specific and it makes you focus on the most important words in any phrase that I'm speaking. It makes you focus on the most important words on any phrase that I'm speaking. I just use four rhetorical gestures. It's what we do in real life. In real life, we don't expect anyone to listen to every word that we're saying. Without even thinking, we make the most important words jump out as we're speaking. So we could go and listen to Hockey Night in Canada and listen to the commentators. <coughs> uh, we could listen to Don Cherry yes. in the intermissions, yes. and we could say, Don, there he's doing rhetorical there, yes. there he's hitting that Without word there. Without a question, unless he has a death, I don't watch Hockey Night in Canada, but unless he has a death grip Why on not, Marshall? I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> if he is someone whose hands are free as he's speaking, without a question, I could say, that was preparatory, that was terminating, that was emphatic, that was you could go through what all of those gestures were. The difference the is, is you said if his hands are free. Yes, if his hands are free to move. He so might if, be holding if, you are, if you are constrained physically, yes. right, gee, I'm talking to Marshall and yes. Jeanette, or having yeah. an interview, yeah. I'm not free to actually express myself. Probably not. And also, particularly if you are also constrained stylistically by an acting style, like the acting style you find in the late 20th, early 21st century, where people on stage are essentially acting as though they're in film. They don't access the arms. The idea of rhetorical gesture seems to be anathema to acting now. So walk me through those four uh, gestures then. Okay, well I'm going to, I, you could subdivide a number of different types of gesture, but let me give you an idea of what people would have been studying if they were studying rhetorical gesture. And this is acting for actors, acting for singers? No distinction whatsoever. No distinction. Singers, actors, uh, people who are going into parliament people who are going to become members of the clergy. Rhetorical, the study of rhetoric. We think of rhetoric now as what you do with your voice. The study of rhetoric was twofold. It was what you do with your voice and how that is accompanied by what you do with your body. So by gesture, I'm going to talk about hands and arms at the moment, but gesture was also, a gesture could be a movement of eye line. A gesture could be a shift of weight. A gesture could be anything that draws attention to a specific word. Again, what I just did, anything that draws attention to a specific word. Emphatic gesture, and this is based on the observation of real life, Robert. This is mm -hmm. an important thing. Rhetorical gesture is to try to help people move naturally while they're dealing with memorized text. Because they realized the whole problem with actors is that the moment you start dealing with memorized text, you're in a different part of the brain than when you're speaking extempore. Yep. Your body will not respond naturally if you are repeating something that has been memorized. We're not wired to do that. It's totally unnatural. 